Take your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter number 26. Appreciate the good testimonies. I want you to continue to pray. There are folks here that I believe, among all the other issues they may have, I believe the one pressing issue today is they need to get born again. I'm trusting the Lord will do that. That's His work. I can't do it. If I could do it, everybody would be saved. I'd just... I mean, I'd, I'd just go out and get everybody saved. It's His work. We are uh, used in His work to preach the gospel. And all those who will repent and believe will be saved. Amen. I believe it's a whosoever gospel. Amen. I'm glad two others believe that with me. It's a whosoever gospel. And I thank God I got in under a whosoever gospel. Because I promise you this, if there were exclusions in the gospel... It just fall my lot to be excluded, Amen. And uh, uh, but I'm glad there's no exclusions. Matthew chapter 26. Stand with me if you will. Verse number 36 is where we're going to be uh, beginning, and then we'll go over to Luke 22 and read a few verses as well. Matthew chapter 26, verse number 36. Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane. Unto a place, uh, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and, two, and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tear ye here and watch with me. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep, and saith unto Peter, What, could you not watch only one hour? Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, Thy will be done. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples, say to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that doth betray me. While you're standing, if you'll flip on over to Luke chapter 22, we'll read one other passage of Scripture. Uh, that uh, is Luke's uh, gospel account of the same um, happening, the same occurrence there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Luke chapter 22, verse number 39. The Bible says, And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. He was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in, ag in an agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from the prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. And he said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon the reading of your word. I ask you, Lord, that you'd please magnify yourself. You know I have no ability to do anything. But Lord, I offer myself as simply a mouthpiece. I beg you, Lord, to be used this morning. I pray that you would please put a gate upon my lips. Let me speak every word I ought to speak and not a single word I should not speak. I pray, Lord, that you would help us now. Lord, there are people here whose souls are in the balance. Lord, today very well may be the last day you deal with their heart. I believe you've already dealt with them. I believe the Holy Ghost conviction is already here and present and you're dealing with hearts already. I pray now that you'd take the word of God, pierce our souls, help us this morning. Lord, save sinners by your grace. And I pray that you would encourage and strengthen the saints of God and we'll bless you and thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Thank you. You can be seated. As we've read these two passages of Scripture, Matthew gives a bit more detail as to the prayer. Luke gives a bit more detail and insight as to the agony of the prayer. 
And so I wanted to read both of those. Uh, Luke here does not record the individual times that he prayed, but he does record one significant point, and that is his sweat, uh, as it were, great drops of blood, speaking of his agony. And uh, Matthew and the book of Mark and the book of John all cover uh, this Garden of Gethsemane experience. Now, before we get into the message today, I want us to go back. Uh, if you want to, you can go with me to Genesis chapter 22. I want to start there and briefly mention last week we know what God did and we thank the Lord for it. And I mentioned this passage of scripture, but I did not, uh, I didn't expand. I'm not going to deal with it in, in length today, but I'm trying and I believe it is the will of God for us to build somewhere. And uh, Lord willing, next week, the Lord's going to bring this to, uh, to uh, uh, a close, if you will, this series of messages that have uh, been preaching on the place. Again, last week I mentioned that I'm um, preaching a series on come to the place. I, I trust that the Holy Ghost will give an invitation to you today to come to the place of Gethsemane and accept the sufferings and the submission of Christ. If, uh, if the invitation is extended today, I trust that you will be obedient to that invitation and that you'll come to the Lord today. I invite you to come to a place. Uh, most of you know where this starts. From just not long ago, we were in Israel, and uh, while we were sitting looking at Skull Hill, looking at the place called Golgotha, and they were describing the place and describing the scene there, uh, I was reminded again in Genesis chapter 22 where Abraham took Isaac up to Mount Moriah, the Bible said, or the land of Moriah, and uh, he offered him there or was, was going to offer. He committed, he surrendered to the will of God. God. He was going to sacrifice his son Isaac on that altar. And the Bible said in verse number nine, and they came to the place which God had told him of. And then if you go over to Luke chapter 23, you will find when they come to Calvary, Lord willing, going to be preaching about that a little bit later. When they came to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him. There's something about that place. As as we were sitting there in Jerusalem and, and on that, uh, the outskirts of that hill there, they began to explain. I looked it up on a map uh, yesterday, and they began to explain the shape of Mount Moriah. Now, Mount Moriah is where the Temple Mount is, and we understand that it, it, it's there where uh, the, the temple was, but that mountain all, also goes up the hill farther than just that. In fact, I believe the, uh, the sea level there on the Temple Mount is about about 745 feet above sea level. And we know it drops way off down to the Dead Sea, not far out of Jerusalem there. And uh, several thousand, or a couple, uh, let's say, what, 1,200, 1,300 feet below sea level down to the Dead Sea. But there on Mount Moriah at the Temple Mount, it's about 745 feet. But when you get up to the top of Mount Moriah, up to where Skull Hill is, where Golgotha is, it's 777 feet high there. So what what I'm trying to tell you is this, the, the traditional place that many believe that, I, that Abraham uh, laid and built the altar was there where the Temple Mount is. I have no problem with that. If you believe that's where the altar was, I'll shout the victory with you. Hallelujah, glory to God, amen. Uh, but one, one other theory, and I believe a very uh, visible theory, is that Abraham was told to go to a place. He was shown a place. And when he was shown that place, he began to ascend up a mountain and I believe pr probably or at least probably could have went to the the highest place on that mountain, which would have been Golgotha. That would have been the same place Christ was crucified. Regardless, it is real close to where Christ was crucified. And, and so I said all that to say this, there's something about that place. But whether you understand the physical place, whether you ever get to sit on those little bleachers there and look over on Golgotha and view Skull Hill, whether or not you ever get to go to the Temple Mount, or whether you ever get to stand at the Wailing Wall, or whether you ever get to stand upon the Mount of Olives and look across at the Eastern Gate there at the Dome of the Rock where it is today, whether or not you ever do that, there better been a time in your life when you went to the place spiritually. I thank God. 
God I can go back to when I was seven years old as a little boy. I went down to an altar of prayer, but I left Alpharetta. Somebody say amen. And I bowed down there in Alpharetta and suddenly I was transported to Calvary. And I'm telling you, I've been to Calvary. Amen. I've been there spiritually speaking. I've nailed at the foot of the cross. The blood has been applied. The sacrifice has been received and accepted on my behalf because I've been to the place. Thank God I've been to the place. Aren't you glad? If you're saved by God's grace, you've been to the place. And that's what we're preaching about is coming to the place. Here in Genesis 22, we have the place of surrender. There is the, the place itself. Then there's the picture here. Abraham is a picture of the heavenly father not withholding his only son. Amen. Aren't you glad that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Thank God he did not withhold his son. But then you have the picture of Isaac as Jesus Christ. Christ, willingly laying down his life at the beck and call of his father. Hey, Isaac walked up there. He carried the wood that he was to be burned on. He walked with his father to an altar and his father said, son, lay down. And as he laid there, he bound his son to the altar there to sacrifice him. And Isaac did not utter a word and he did not go against him. He accepted and surrendered to the will of his father. That's exactly what Jesus Christ did as the willing sacrifice. He did not kick against what God wanted. Many have said Gethsemane was, was Jesus' moment of rebellion. Oh no, my friend, it was not a moment of rebellion at all. Jesus Christ never had a moment of rebellion. If Christ ever rebelled against the Father, then He's no longer qualified to be our Savior because the Bible said rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. And my dear friend, my Savior ain't no witch. Amen. Hallelujah. I'll fight over over that when you want to meet me in the parking lot uh, me and brother Scott will meet you out there somebody say amen amen you don't call my savior a witch he's not a witch he's the holy lamb of God a spotless and the Bible said there John looked at Jesus while he was baptized and said behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world in that statement he said he is the savior but he also said he's qualified to be the savior he's spotless he's holy he is blameless he's, he's pure he's clean he's righteous that is our savior Aren't you glad of that? Jesus did not buck. He did not rebel against the command of the Father. So we have the picture there. And then we have the personal application in Genesis chapter 22. Or 22 is this. And uh, the end of 22 there, he, he built an altar. And uh, he called it Jehovah Jireh there. The Lord will provide because he did not want to forget his moment of surrender. He didn't want to forget what God did when he surrendered. Can I tell you, I've got a money. Hallelujah, glory to God. I've got a monument down there and nobody knows about it. You can go in Philadelphia Baptist Church and you can go over there to the altar where I got saved and nobody can see the monument. But Brother Troy, in my heart, I've got a monument set up in my heart and I can go back to the place I surrendered. And I remember what God did when I finally surrendered to Him. I remember when God redeemed me and birthed me into the family of God. When I accepted what God wanted and thank God for the personal application in Genesis 22, a place of surrender. But today I want you to notice a place of submission. We go back now to Matthew 26 and Luke chapter 22 and we'll examine this for just a little bit. I want you to notice the location of the place. Having just been there recently, you will probably find that a lot of my preaching is affected, at least for a little while, uh, about actual places because for so long I've read about places and now I've had the privilege of seeing them so it gives a little visual. I'm going to try to paint a picture of the location of Gethsemane. We went there and we, we gathered there in the garden, what, what they now have is the Garden of Gethsemane. There's a church there. It's, uh, there's a church on pretty well any site that they consider holy because certain religions worship places more than they worship a person. Amen. And we won't get into that because I don't have near enough time to do it. 
But as we got there in Gethsemane, there was one tree in particular. They, said, they, they showed us the trees and they said a lot of these trees are many hundred years old, but there's one back in the center of the garden back there. It's enormous olive tree. And they said that one is probably around 2,000 years old. And it dawned on me that very tree could have been there when Christ was praying on my behalf in the garden of Gethsemane. I want you to see the location. As Christ gathered in the garden of Gethsemane, on one side of him would have been uh, the, the, Kid, the brook Kidron, the Kidron Valley there. And then the wall of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount would have been there to, if you're facing down the valley, it would have been to his right there. Uh, and then just up above there would have been Golgotha and would have, would have been the Garden Tomb where he would have been buried, where he rose from the dead. Uh, the Eastern Gate is right there to your right as you're standing in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, but on the other side, Christ, is standing at the foot of the Mount of Olives. So from this side of the Garden of Gethsemane upward, you've got the Mount of Olives. Here's my thinking. Imagine Christ now. He is submitting to the will of His Father. He's coming. He knows the plan. He knows what God has in store. He knows instead of going up to the Mount of Olives where He desires to go, I'm sure He would have loved to went up there and went ahead and fulfilled the book of Zechariah and His feet stand upon the Mount of Olives and march triumphantly down through the eastern gate and set up his rule and reign on the temple. Now, I'm sure he would have loved to do that, but instead, in the Garden of Gethsemane, he came to the realization and acceptance and submitted to the fact, I am not going up this mountain, but I'm going up this mountain. I'm not going in triumph now. I'm going in weakness now. I'm not coming to rule. I'm coming to be put to death. I'm coming to lay down my life as he is submitting in this garden of Gethsemane, he has his whole life before him. He has the Mount of Olives, his victory in the very end. And by the way, it's going to happen. You mark it down. Thank God. Bless his holy name. He is coming back to the Mount of Olives, just like he said. He is going to march into Jerusalem. He is going to rule and reign with a rod of iron. He is going to set up his throne. He is going to rule from the throne of his father, David. Mark it down. It will take place. But Jesus is looking to the Mount of Olives here and He says, one day, one day I'll come there, but for now I must go here. And He submits to the Father's will and He said, Lord, if it be Your will that I go this way, if it be Your will that I cross this brook and go up to that lonely mountain, Thy will, not my will be done. We see the location of the place. Secondly, not only the location, what about the loneliness of the place? And I want to get somewhere, so I'm trying to hurry through these. The loneliness of the place. When Jesus was on the Sea of Galilee, and He's crossing the Sea of Galilee, there's a great multitude that meets Him there. There's a great multitude that says, we want to see more of your miracles. When he sits down with the 5,000, he pulls out the, the, the loaves and the fish. There's, there's multitudes there. And the Bible said that's just, a, that's just a count of the men. Literally thousands of people gathered around Jesus so that he could feed them. As he walks around through the city, uh, they're thronging the streets and there are great press following after him. One lady, she's trying to fight through the press of people just to touch the hem of his garment. What I'm telling you is this, up to this point, Jesus has been crowded. Throngs of people have been gathered around him, but now he comes just him and his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane. When he gets to the garden, he tells his disciples, you stay here. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. We'll go a little farther. So now his disciples are no longer with him. It's just Peter, James, and John, and they go a little ways. And then he turns to them and says, Peter, James, John, you stay here. I'm going to go over there and pray. And Jesus Christ totally isolates himself. Can I tell you, my dear friend, when you get in a place of submission to God, it may be a lonely place. It may be a place where you cannot stand with any others. It may be a place that God puts you in solitary confinement. It may be a place where He takes you away from everywhere else. Oh, but can I encourage you, if you get there and God shows up, if you get there and nobody else is around, but the good God of heaven comes to visit you, I say spend all your days alone if it means being with the Lord. 
Because when he got over there, he was talking to the Father. And they were communing. Hallelujah. Oh, Brother Hugh, there's nothing like the company of the Lord. I've got a quote up in my office, and I don't even know if I can get it exactly right. And it says it would pay, it would do you well to be often alone. But you are never less alone than when alone. Amen. Let me translate that. It'd do you real good to get away from everybody. But when you get away from everybody, there's still somebody there with you. And if you can get isolated from everybody else and just get with that one that'll never leave you, that one that'll never leave, that one that'll never walk away, that one that'll always be there morning, noon, and night, that one that'll be there every time you cry out, I want you to know to do you well, to be alone if you could just be with him. The loneliness, the disciples could only go so far. I guess there's a spiritual application there we could throw out there. How far could you go with him? You see, some of you, you're just a member of the crowd. You're just there to see Jesus do things. You couldn't, get, you couldn't even go to Gethsemane. You wouldn't, even got, you wouldn't even got invited on the trip. Amen. And then how many of you that are followers, I'm talking about your followers, your disciples, how many of you would Jesus have personally turned around and said, I want you and you and you to go with me the rest of you stay? How many would have received that invitation? Can you imagine that? I mean, he's dwindling the crowd down. And then Christ even isolates himself from them. So I just wonder sometimes, how far would I have gotten to go? We were talking on the way down to church today in Ashland. We were talking about Calvary, talking about the crucifixion. And Ashland asked me, she said, Daddy, have you ever thought, what would you have done if you were there that day? Watching the crucifixion. And I did not answer there. I, I, I don't think I gave you an answer of any kind. I just, I rode in silence thinking about that thought. And I wonder, what would I have done? Would I have been one of the crowd weeping and crying because my only hope was dying? Would I have been of the crowd that was laughing and scorning because the majority of the crowd was laughing and scorning? Would I have been one of the soldiers that was actually doing the beating? Where would I have fit into that scene? That's a good question to ask, isn't it? Amen. Because it gives you a chance to meditate upon your own self. I'll be honest with you, Brother Scott, I got a little scared at the answer. Don't get mad at me. Don't get upset. I got a little scared at the answer as I was thinking about it. The truth is, knowing my wicked heart, it's hard to tell where I would have been. It's hard to tell what group I would have fit into knowing my wicked heart. Amen. He said, oh, I'm so spiritual. I'm so godly. I know where I'd have been. I'd have been on the cross with Jesus. I'd have crawled up on his back. Well, bless your heart. I don't know exactly where I would have been. I trust I would have been the one looking on, to the, looking on Calvary and saying, that's my Savior. He's dying for me because there were a group of people there that believed on Him. I, I trust I would have been one of them. I trust if I was not one of them, then I would have at least been one of the ones like the soldier was when Jesus lifted His voice and yielded up the ghost. And the soldier said, truly this was the Son of God. Maybe I would have been at least in that crowd but the truth is, I'm scared to even think about where my wicked heart would have had me if I was sitting around Calvary. The loneliness of the place, that's just a side note. How far would you have gone? The loneliness of the place there, the location of the place. I want to focus for a few minutes now. I want to come down and preach on this thought, the love of the place of Gethsemane. We do not often comprehend what God did for us in Gethsemane. We don't often comprehend. We know that He prayed there. We sang about it this morning. The second verse there, the uh, second to the last line, uh, Brittany talked about a lonely garden where Jesus prayed. That speaking of Gethsemane, we, we talk about the story, but I don't think often we contemplate really what took place when Christ was in Gethsemane. And I want us to do that for a few moments. First, I think we ought to examine the contents of the cup. He makes reference here in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter number 22 in verse number 39. Is that where we were? 
I'm so far out of the text now, I don't even know where I'm at. Verse number 39 is where we began reading. And uh, he said, verse 42, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. What cup is he speaking of and what's in the cup? Let me mention three things that I believe were in that cup. Number one, it was the suffering of Christ that was in that cup. He knew when he accepted the will of God, when he drank from this cup, when he accepted God's will, he knew that there was a great deal of physical suffering that was to come. You understand when Jesus was in the flesh, he was in the same flesh you and I are in. He felt the same way that we feel. Pain, sought, pain came on his body the same way it comes on our body. He had nerve endings just like we have nerve endings. He had tissue just like we have tissue. He had blood like we have blood, except his blood was holy. Oh, hallelujah. Stop right there and shout for a while. His blood was holy. His blood was spotless. His blood was not the blood of man. His blood was not from his father, from his father Adam, but his blood was from his father God. I thank God for the blood of Jesus. Hey, listen, I'm not getting away from the blood. We'll still sing about the blood and preach about the blood and shout about the blood because thank God for his blood. He had blood just like we've got blood but it was holy. So when Jesus began to so when Jesus took this cup he knew he was accepting the scourging. He knew that the will of God was going to entail the scourging. As I mentioned before, we, we stood in that little room there under Caiaphas' house and we saw the footholds where, uh, where they would have placed his feet and then we saw the places where they would have tied his hands and stretched him out. And then the soldiers would have beaten him and beaten him and beaten him and beaten him. Now this was all privately. Then they would take him out and do it publicly so that everyone could see him. He was literally a bloody, mangled mess when he was crucified. The flesh would have been hanging from his body. His nerve endings all up his spine would have been exposed to the air and exposed to the elements and exposed to the scourging. When they put that robe upon him, it would have begun to dry to his back. And when they ripped it off again, reopening all the wounds, this is what Jesus knew when he accepted the cup. He was accepting his own sufferings. Not only was he accepting the sufferings, I believe probably that was the least of his agony when he looked at the cup. Because also in that cup were not only his sufferings, but sin was in that cup. Sin was in the cup. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Jesus had never touched sin, never tasted sin, never had any dealings with sin. Jesus was absolutely pure and absolutely spotless. Peter said there was no guile found in him. Pilate said, I can find no fault in him. The John said, behold, the Lamb of God signifying his holiness and his acceptable offering. I'm telling you, Jesus was spotless. He knew no sin. But yet he knew when he accepted that cup, he was receiving sin. He was going to take sin upon it. Just think about this. Every rape that would ever been committed, every rape that ever had been committed, every molestation that ever had been or ever was committed or ever would be committed, every, every murder that would be ever committed, every lie that would ever... Oh, can you imagine every lie that was ever told, every theft that ever took place, every sin of all mankind, was inside that cup. And when he took the cup, he knew not only am I taking one sin, I'm taking the sin of the world and I'm accepting the, to take and to carry and to bear the sin of all mankind. He's not worried so much about the suffering, but he knows when he accepts the cup, he accepts the sin of man. He hates sin. He always has hated sin. He still hates sin today. He loves sinners, but he hates sin. He never, he never will love sin. Hey Amen. Y'all not get quiet right there. Y'all thank God he doesn't love sin. He does not love sin. He hates sin. He's always stood in opposition to sin. There, there are, there are uh, 
parallels or comparisons that are given in Scripture. You'll read about those in darkness and those in light. You'll read about those that are dead and those that are living. You'll read about right and wrong and they never mix. And can I tell you, you read about sin and you read about the holiness of God and they never mix. But you know that Jesus Christ was going to have to take upon Himself the sin of the whole world when He took that cup. Oh, what agony it caused when He thought about that. I believe the suffering was bad. I believe the sin was worse. But I believe the third thing that was found in the cup was probably the worst of all. Because inside that cup was not only the sufferings He would endure on the cross, and the sin of the whole world, but inside that cup was a separation from God the Father. The Bible said, Jesus Himself said, I and the Father are one. If you go back and study creation, you'll find that the Bible said that the God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost were all there at creation. Let us make man in our image. In fact, John chapter number 1, you read that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same as in the beginning with God. And then the Bible said, without Him was not anything made that was made. And we're talking about Christ there. So Jesus was around at creation. Not only was He around in creation, He was around in eternity past. Amen. Eternity past. So how far is eternity past? As far as eternity future in the other way. So what I'm trying to tell you is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost had always been together, never been separated, never had a division among them. But Jesus looked down into that cup and when He looked in the cup, He knew He was going to be separated from His Father. He knew He was going to have to listen. Oh my, I cannot, I cannot imagine the weight that's falling just upon me thinking about it. But think about what Christ was enduring as He realized He was going to have to hear the statement. Hey, He was going to have to he was going to have to feel the separation and Christ was going to have to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Jesus looked down into the cup and he saw when he was on the cross bearing our sin, he was going to look around for the first time in eternity. He wasn't going to be able to find his father. Oh my, my mind this morning goes back to Montana. Grew up, of course, in Alpharetta. I've always been close to my family. I've always had a good relationship with my parents. I, we moved to Montana. I hadn't been there all that long. Winter had set in, and when winter set in, I had a busted pipe. It's amazing how you can fall apart on a busted pipe. But I remember getting up under that house, and I was trying to thaw it out, and I was trying to fix the pipe. I had never soldered anything in my whole life. Daddy had always done that. I've watched Daddy solder copper. I mean, all my life I'd watched him solder copper, but I had never done it. And I'm laying there on my back, and it suddenly hit me. I was 2,000 miles away from the man that could fix everything. And I'm telling you, it hit me so hard. I laid there, Brother Ron, on my back up under that house, weeping. I'm talking about we. I wasn't holding up. There wasn't nobody around anyway, so it didn't matter. Openly weeping. Why? Because I was separated from my father. But you know what? When I got out from under the house, he was only a phone call away. I could call him. I could talk to him. I wasn't sure. He had not turned his back on me. There was still a connection there. But Christ looked into that cup. And there wasn't going to be any calling Him. There wasn't going to be any crying out to Him. He knew when He became sin, He was going to be separated from God the Father. And as He looked in that cup, He knew when He accepted the cup, He accepted the separation from God the Father. And I believe when He cried out, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Something in Jesus was saying, I don't want to be separated from you. I've never been separated from you. I don't want to be separated from you. I don't want to carry sin. I don't want to suffer. But oh, Father, I don't want to be separated from you. Nevertheless, oh my, he said that for me, church. He said, nevertheless, for me. He said, nevertheless, if it means separation, 
If that is your will, Father, if that's what you want, Father, your will, not my will be done. And for me on the cross of Calvary, and for you on the cross of Calvary, He accepted the fact He would be separated from His Father. And He cried, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. I believe we've got to understand the contents of the cup. I think we've got to understand the concept of the cup. To accept this cup was his submission to partake of everything in the cup. You see, when he said, we, we say that statement, we throw it around like it's some kind of rag doll. Not thy will, but, or not my will, but thy will be done, O Lord. We pray it so flippantly. We pray it with, without any thought. Because it's easy to say, isn't it? Not as I will, but as thou wilt, O Lord. Oh, it's an easy prayer to pray. Do you understand when Christ said it, he accepted the suffering, he accepted the sin, he accepted the separation. He said, God, I'll take everything in the cup. That is the concept of the cup. Not only to partake of it, to accept the cup was to associate with what was in the cup. Here's where, here's where it falls on me so heavily. When Christ said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. He said, Father, I know in this decision to submit to you, I am disassociating myself with you. And I'm associating myself with them. Oh, I can't get past it. I can't get over it. It just swells up in me and it breaks my heart to think that the God of heaven, the God of love, the God of all of eternity, the God of creation would choose to disassociate Himself with heaven and associate Himself with me, associate Himself with a sinner such as I. Who am I that a king would bleed and die for? Who am I that He would pray, not my will thine for? What am I... What have I ever done? But yet, when he accepted the cup, he associated with the things in the cup. He associated with sinners. Don't try to understand it. I've been trying for years and I can't. Brother Troy has been trying for a lot more years than I have and he can't understand it. But I sure am glad he chose to associate with the cup. Oh my, I'm so glad he chose to associate with me and take my penalty and take my sin. Got the contents of the cup, the concept of the cup, and then the consumption of the cup. When Christ consumed the contents of the cup, he drank it all. Hey Amen. Some of you might want to tighten your shoes so they don't slip off when you take off running. Because when, he, oh my, when he took the cup, he took it all. Say, so what's that mean? That means when Christ took the cup, he consumed all suffering. <laughs> Every broken heart that would ever break. He took it to the cross of Calvary. Every wound that would ever be born in a man, He took to the cross of Calvary. Every limp that we would have spiritually, every bad day, every dark cloud, every bit of depression, every bit of discouragement. Brother Troy took every bit of it. He was in the cup and he drank of the cup. So he took all the sufferings to Calvary and he bore them all. Oh, but it gets better. <laughs> Sin was in the cup. And when he took the cup, he took all sin. <laughs> he took all sin and he bore all sin to Calvary. 
I'm talking about every sin that I ever have committed, every sin that I ever will commit, every sin of every man in every nation, of every race, every wicked thought, every vile temptation. He took it all and He bore it to Calvary and He consumed sin when He consumed the contents of the cup. Oh, but we're enjoying that. Let's enjoy a little more. RJ, when he consumed the cup, physically it wasn't a cup. Emotionally and spiritually it was. And he took the cup. He said, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he took the cup. If you want a visual, he just, he drank every bit of it up. So the cup was empty. And sin was in the cup. And suffering was in the cup. But RJ... Separation was in the cup. I was separated from God. Mm, hallelujah. I was separated from God. I mean, my sin had separated me from Him. I did not have a relationship with Him. I was without. I was without hope. I was without God in the world. I'm telling you, I was separated from God. But when He took the cup, hallelujah, blessed be the name of the Lord, when He took the cup, Son, He took all that separation and He consumed it all so that I'd never have to be separated. Glory to God, hallelujah, so I'd never, ever have to be separated from Him again. Oh, who can separate us from the love of Christ? I say not principalities, not powers, nor height, nor depth. Nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Why? Because He took the separation and He consumed it all. Hallelujah. Bless His holy name. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bless His holy name. Hallelujah to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb of God slain to take away the sin of men. I say hallelujah to God. He consumed the cup. He consumed the contents. He took all my separation. And I will never, ever, no never, be separated from God again. <laughs> oh, you say one day you're going to die, preacher. Well, I reckon so. I'm holding on to the hope of the rapture, to be honest with you. But I've been to enough funerals to know what happens. And I know that one day I could die. The Bible said, "Be absent from bodies, be present with the Lord." Amen. You think death's going to separate me? Oh no! Christ whooped death on the cross. Yeah. Next Sunday we're going to we're going to celebrate. I think you ought to celebrate it all the time anyway. Next Sunday we're going to officially celebrate His victory over death. Yes. We're going to look at death next week, worldwide. Really, we're going to say, "Oh, death." Where's thy sting? Grave, where's thy victory? Amen. That's not going to separate me from Him. Oh no. I will never be separated from God because He consumed the contents of the cup for you and I. Stand our feet with every head bowed and every eye closed, please.